going to, uh, we tried to get down through verse uh, 3 last time, but we didn't make it, so we're going to pick up at verse 3 and um, work our way down into the next section. Uh, so Romans 8 and verse number 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His Son in, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now that first section here, the first four verses in Romans 8 now deals with um, our power source. And as we get introduced to the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there is therefore now. So there's a reach back up into chapter 7, a continuation of the thought pattern there of uh, being under the law, O wretched man that I am, that's bringing death and frustration and so forth. Now, therefore, now, no condemnation. And again, the condemnation there has nothing to do with your redemption, your justification. This has to do with your walk, your sanctification, your, your walk in time. And, and we saw that last time. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. That's the new law, if you will. The new rule. The new thing that's going to govern and power to control and to, has the rule over. Now it's the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And again, in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So we're talking about the new identity. We're talking about our that newness of life, the newness of the Spirit, chapter 7 there, um, verse 6, I believe it was, talked about. So you have this new thing, you got this new power grid coming on in your life that you that was given to you. The moment of salvation, you just don't know about it till you're in here to chapter 8. You know, you get saved, you're just relishing in the fact that you have your sins forgiven, you have peace with God, you have eternal life, and then he says, okay, by the way, you also have the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So we got down to verse 3. I want to pick in verse 3 and 4, and then uh, we'll work our way down then into the second section here of this first half of Romans 8. And that's the issue of the provision that starts in verse 5 and goes down to verse 8. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we get there. So verse 3, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. Again, what a great summary of chapter 7. The law is weak. It, 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 it doesn't, can't do. God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. So He's not talking about Romans 6 here, where we are, our old man is crucified. When He talks there about being condemned sin in the flesh, He's not talking about Romans 6 there. He's talking about actually something else. So if you think about this, if Jesus Christ condemns sin in the flesh, Yet we still have what? The sin nature. So he didn't do a very good job, did he? See, that's the idea that runs in that. But that's not what Paul's dealing with. He, he, Paul's talking about something else. And when you begin to think about the issue of condemning sin in the flesh, he condemns sin by the newness of, of what kind of life? Do you remember when we're in Romans 6? The newness of life? Resurrect. Look back at chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. You see, he condemns sin by the newness of resurrection life. All right? And that's where the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of life, comes in. 
Come over to Hebrews chapter 2. Notice this. The only answer to the issue of sin and the issue of the condemnation and condemning sin is the issue of resurrection life. And as we begin to understand how we truly walk, truly serve, truly live for God, walk after the Spirit, mind the things of the Spirit. We're getting to that here in the next verse, in verse 5. It all begins with the issue of resurrection life and that newness there. And again, what Paul's talking about, Christ went and died at Calvary, and we have that identity with his death, burial, and resurrection. But what did he also do? He condemned sin in the flesh. He left it in the flesh. He resurrected. Hebrews 2, notice Hebrews 2, notice verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. Why was man a little lower than the angels? Why was Jesus made, in the likeness of men, a little lower than the angels? For the what? The suffering of death. See, the angels can't die. But man does, so, he, so there we are. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now drop to verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name before my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. Now that's the Hebrew, we're in Hebrews, that's the little flock, the congregation there, This the brethren here are the little flock, okay? But what I want you to catch is what he's now going to say. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God had given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He was what? Made in the likeness of men. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't have sin. He was in the likeness of it. Keep reading. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Flesh and blood. Jesus Christ there in the likeness of flesh. And what we're learning is, as he became flesh and blood, he went through death, but who is he after destroying? <laughs> the adversary. Verse 16. For verily he took on him the nature of angels, I'm sorry, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Well, when what happened to the Lord? He became flesh, he went and died, but then he did something no man had done, and that was resurrected and stayed resurrected, <laughs> Okay. The issue here, when you come back to Romans 8, in verse 3, when he says he condemned sin in the flesh, is he is talking about resurrection life here. What, look at what resurrection life did. The law was condemned in the flesh, condemned in that it was weak through the flesh. All the law ever wants to do is fulfill the lust of your flesh. Make me look good, make me smell good, make me taste good, make me okay. And your flesh loves that. That's the sin, deceived me, and then slew me, chapter 7. Why? Because the law says if you do this, you're going to be right. If you do what, and God came in, in Ephesians, Paul tells us that he, in Colossians, that he, uh, what did he do with the handwriting of ordinances that were against us? He, he blotted them out. See, he took care of that. But how did he take care of it? On the third day, he arose. It wasn't enough for him just to die. See, he had to do what? On the third day, he had to resurrect. He had to come up and stay up. Otherwise, the bolster about, I'm going to do this, would have been, it would have been just like Muhammad and Buddha and the rest of the guys. But no, he resurrected, stayed there. So back in 8.3 8, here, 
for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And again, it's likeness. He doesn't have it. He who knew no sin was made to be sin. <laughs> See? Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.21 there. So what does he do here? He condemns sin in the flesh. That, the reason, the, the purpose here, as we continue to learn about the power source, here we're going to learn that the, the, that, something else happened. Something came up here that needs to be now addressed. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now think about that. What are we going to learn? What are we learning? That the righteousness of the law is fulfilled where? In us. Notice it doesn't say that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled by the law. doesn't say that. Notice it doesn't say that it is fulfilled by us. It says it's fulfilled where? In us. Well, who's in us? <laughs> well, the Godhead's in you now. You're, ju- you're in Christ. That's why when you come into this passage, the condemnation has nothing to do about your justification. It has everything to do about your walk in time, that functional death issue. Some will say that because, and they use this passage to say it, by the way, that we are now equipped to live under the law because we're saved, we're justified. Well, that's not what verse 4 just said. Most try to say that we can do, we can do, because we're justified, because we're saved, we can now do everything that the law requires. Well, how were you doing that before? <laughs> you weren't doing, what did chapter 7 say? Paul says, I was alive once. I was doing Right. The commandment came around, got me, sin revived, went to work, the motions of sin, and I did what? I died. You see, what the verse is communicating is that there is something now in the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the pre- this power source, there's something now that has, that is being, that has been, not being, been achieved. Actually, the verse says, fulfilled, past tense. When you fulfill something, what are you in the process of doing? Completing it. When you have fulfilled it, you're what? You're done. See? In Acts 2, it says the day of Pentecost has fully come. Guess what? It's being what? Done. Now, they're going to have future days of Pentecost, don't get me wrong, because of the calendar, but the fulfillment of it has been accomplished. You see, what's happening here now is there is a goal here that the law had. Come back with me to Deuteronomy 6. And there's, a, there's something in the law that the law had a goal. It, it, the law had an ob, ob, objective to accomplish. When God gave the law to Adam and Eve in the garden, its design was to accomplish something, okay? When God gave Abraham the law, Genesis 12 and following, it was designed to accomplish something. When, but when God gave the law to Moses and the thou shalt not went into it, the conditions of the if and the thens, You see, with Abraham, there was no thou shalt not kill. There wasn't. There was just all the other (laughs) righteous stuff. But Moses, Galatians says that the law was added because of the transgression. So now we have to have a what? Thou shalt not, because there's transgression. The law is, the law, what did the law demand? See, the law demanded something. Look at Deuteronomy 6, look at verse 24. The Lord commanded us 
to do all these statutes. To fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. What, did the law, what does the law demand here? That you do. How are you to do? Halfway or per- perfect? Perfect. Some of the way, I got three quarters of it, we're good, right? <laughs> no. It's perfect. You see, the right, it demanded perfect righteousness. And Israel was commanded, the Lord commanded us to do all the, Israel was commanded to do, not a suggestion. Oh, man, we love suggestions, don't we? <laughs> Over there in Ephesians 2, verse 10, he talks about the good works that we should do. And everybody, oh, yeah, we should do that. But yet, that's a command. One of the variants out of the word should and its definition is commanded to do, to perform. There's a, that's not a suggestion. That's a, you should do this. You know, but notice verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Notice it becomes what? Our righteousness if we do. So now now we have this, the righteousness of the law versus the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And in Romans 7, we found out that our righteousness isn't doing it, that we want Philippians 2, or Philippians uh, 3 over there, we want his righteousness. And that's what we're learning. But what does the law demand here? What's it expecting? It's expecting obedience. It's expecting righteous obedience. And it's expecting obedience that's produced by our self-effort and our energy. Come back to Romans 10. And when we understand what, that the law is seeking righteousness, again, you have to remember, what's the law? The law is like that MRI, like the flashlight in a dark room looking for it, isn't it? That MRI says you got brain, you got brain cancer. That MRI don't fix it. It just has what? It just says you have it. See, that's what the law is doing. The law is looking for righteousness. And guess what? You don't got it. So it says what? You don't have it. (laughs) But it's pushing. In Romans 10 here, uh, verse 3, Israel was blinded by that, by the way. They were frustrated. They were fixated, I should say, on this false sense that God would give them The righteous when they did, when they were doing. See, Romans 10 verse 3, For they, and that's Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness. Think about that. They had the oracles of God. They had the law given to them. And what does Paul say they were? Not stupid, ignorant. They had it. Paul was a Pharisee. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He knew the, pertaining to the righteousness of the law, blameless, he said. They knew it. They were just going about it how? Incorrectly. And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Wait a minute. What did the law say? Do you remember Exodus 19? Moses comes down. He's dealing with the people, and and he says, if you obey, then you will be. And you know what they said? Anything you tell us, God, we're going to do it. And you know what God instantly did? Thunder rolled down off that hill. He put up a hedge around that and said, you ain't coming up here by me no more. You're going to have to go in a different way. And chapter 20, he establishes the Ten Commandments, and and off he goes. What, what, what should have been their thing? We can't do that. We can't do this. We need you to do it. By the way, they had just had five tests in the wilderness, those five, five Jehovah compound names, to teach them that, guess what, they couldn't do it on their own. To teach them that they needed 
Jehovah. They needed the I am, fill in the blank, whatever you need me to be. They needed that, but yet what did they do? We can develop our own righteousness. That's what verse 3, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness. They didn't come in submission. We're going to talk about submission next hour with, uh, in our being filled with the Spirit. We're talking about the wives now, verse 20. Yeah, oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, that, was a, that was a moan. <laughs> you know. But submission, doing what? Putting your, we've already talked about submission last week. Putting yourself under the authority and the influence of others. What did they not do? They didn't submit to that. They didn't put themselves under and say, look, we can't do this. You need to do it. What did they do? We can do it. And boom. Paul says, I was there, and it frustrated me to no end. Now watch verse 4. And Christ is the what? End of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The law demanded unbroken righteousness. The law seeks a life of righteousness, of right living. And you know what we learn? Romans 7, oh, wretched man that I am. Man, I want to do good, I do bad. And when I don't want to do bad, I do it anyway. Who can save me from this body of death? Paul says we have a source. We have an answer. And it's the operating, it's the person of, it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now go back to Romans 8. It's the issue here of, hey, Romans 8 verse 4, for the, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? In us. Who is in us? Christ, right? What did 10.4 just say? Christ is the what? End of the law. You know, fulfilled, it's done. The righteousness of the law, the right living, the right, all of that righteous that the law demanded, it's been taken care of in Christ, who, by the way, is where? In you. That's pretty good, in my estimation. You see, folks, we're, we have learned, think about what we've learned. Romans 6, we're dead to sin, right? Why? Because we're alive unto God. We're alive through Christ. We've got this new identity. We've got this new uh, position. Then we learn we're dead to the law. Now what are we learning? That the Spirit and the law by the rule, the law by which the Spirit operates is, is bringing life in Christ Jesus, which brings an end to the issue of sin having dominion in my life and the law having dominion in my life. Because who am I living? Who am I walking after? I'm walking after the Spirit. And when I walk after the Spirit, then real quickly, verse 5, and they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You see, if I'm minding the things of the Spirit, which, by the way, are what? The things, back up there in verse 1, to them which are in Christ Jesus. What, we said this last week. What is the mind of the Spirit? He's concentrating. He's saturated with Christ and what He's doing for you, with you, in you. And He's constantly focusing that way. Your, Ephesians 3, r run over there real quick. Ephesians 3, verse 16. Ephesians 3, 16. You see, when we talk about walking after the Spirit, we're not talking about walking around, you know, blindfolded in a dark cave going backwards. We're after, proceeding, looking for, actively going after, moving toward the things that the Spirit minds. What, are the, what does the Spirit mind? He minds the things that, that Christ is doing. Ephesians 3.16, Paul prays here that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Where does the Holy Spirit working? In that inner man so that, who, so that what can happen? Christ can dwell there. Be at home. 
I mean, I don't know if you go back to Romans 8, if you think about Christ being at home in your life, that requires the Holy Spirit to go in there <laughs> and clean up the house. Danielle moved out of her apartment. She's got to clean the apartment now. So what do you do? You go in and you vacuum. They want her to clean the ceiling. I never heard of that before. How do you do that? I don't know. It's in her checkout list. I'm like, ceiling? How do you clean the ceiling? I don't know. Well, we're going to figure it out, aren't we? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Get a Swiffer. There you go. Okay. So, But what do you do? You go in and what do you do? You, you spruce it up. You clean it up, right? Then, by the way, guess what the apartment complex is going to do? They're going to send in their own cleaners and clean it anyway. You know, but if you want your money back, you got to do your part. I got that. Think about the Holy Spirit in your life. You just trust, trusted Christ. You're sealed with the Spirit. He comes in working through the Word of God, and you know what he begins to do to your life? Clean it up. Because there's a new tenant moving in. And that tenant is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he comes into your mind, into your thinking, and he begins to clean and push away. Now, he uses the Word of God. That's his swifter, swiffer, okay? And he's using the Word of God and so forth, and he begins to move things, and then he begins to repaint the walls and says, here's your blessings. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what Christ, here's who you are. And he, paint, he wallpapers the wall with the Word of God, rightly divided, if, if, okay? Verse 4 says, when that happened, the, law, the righteousness that the law demanded... That moral living, that, that perfect righteousness has been fulfilled. So guess what? You don't have to do anything. There's literally nothing for you to do. Come over with me to Galatians 3. Now, I, I told Ricky we'd probably get down to verse 6. I don't know. We'll see. Notice, I want you to think about when he says, in Christ, we have the end of the standard for sanctified righteousness. What did Deuteronomy 6 say? You have to do all of this to have. Romans 10, what were they ignorant? What were they seeking to establish? Their own righteousness. See? In Christ, that, by the way, that sanctified righteousness is what this is. It's working. It's the outward flow. Okay? Now in Christ, what we're learning because of the Holy Spirit, the power source, is that that standard, the law, for sanctified righteousness has been what? Completed. It's done. It's over. The operating system, that operating system is no longer valid. In fact, it's contrary to what God's doing today. And even... Harder than that, if, harsher than that, if you will, is how dare you live under something that God says is dead and done. So that you think you can gain something you already have. You see, we're all equally complete in Christ. We're all equally blessed. We've got given, it's been given to us. Now think about God said, I've ended that program. I've ended that system. Don't you go back and resurrect that system. Look at Galatians 3, verse 1. What was Galatia, what was going on at Galatia? They were mixing law and grace, weren't they? They left the grace of God and they were back over underneath the Mosaic system of living. They were... He, he's going to say here in chapter 3, uh, he said, uh, verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Where did God condemn sin? In the flesh. Where was the law weak? In the flesh. You guys are living back over there underneath that system. He said there, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth, crucified among you. They believe Paul's gospel for their justification. 
But for their walk, sanctification, you know where they went? Back to Moses. And you know what Paul says? O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? And that bewitching there is something that you just don't skip over. It's one of the tactics by Satan to attack you and I today. Beguilement, beguiled with enticing words, but bewitching. Come back with me to 1 Samuel 28. And this is what Paul is talking about. And this is why he would say in Romans 8, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in you. It is done. Don't resurrect that old law program. 1 Samuel 28. Now in 1 Samuel 28, you have David and Saul going at it back and forth, okay? And you have Saul, verse 7, with the witch of Endor. And Saul, verse 7, then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on an other raiment. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me, bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. By the way, God has told Israel, don't you mess in necromancy. That's what we're talking about, the raising of the dead, the spirits, okay? Verse 9, And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest uh, thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her. I, I mean, she's, you, you, you're just doing this to get me in trouble, <laughs> you know. And Saul swear by her. By the Lord saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Saul. I'm sorry, Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God's ascending out of the earth, and off he goes. Verse 15, and Saul said to Sa Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed. Verse 16, Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by him, for the Lord had rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor even to David. Samuel's like, why in the world are you doing something that the Lord said you're not supposed to do? What did Saul go do? He got him a witch to raise up something that was dead. So back in Galatians 3, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, who has caused you to raise up something that God has declared to be dead? That law system. Romans 8. Go back to Romans 8. See, Romans 7. You see, raising, living underneath that law system, ain't no, don't, 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 don't do that. <laughs> and actually, it's not just a don't do that, it's a how dare you do that. Well, you do that because you don't understand who you are and, what, and what's going on here. So go back to Romans 8, verse 4. Again, you have to remember its context here. The law is a means of, as a means of sanctification, is fulfilled. Again, verse 4, that, that first word, the perp, why, why, why 8, 3? Why does he condemn sin in the flesh? Why is he, why is the law weak in the flesh? What's going on? Why that, the righteousness of the law, why did he do that? So that the righteousness of the law would be fulfilled where? In us. Again, we know, chapter 1 to 5, that the righteousness of the law can't justify you. We understand that. We're learning here in 6, 7, and 8 that the righteousness of can't give us a walk, sanctification either. 
It's complete, it's, it's fulfilled. And again, he says, the end of the verse, who had walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So again, that has to do with our walk, not our redemption, our justification. So now he says, verse 5, for, what is the word for? Further explanation. You see your power center now is going to be the spirit is going to be the Holy Spirit. Now watch the provision of it. Watch now we're going to take what we just learned and figured out here and we're going to bring it now into the reality of our life. We're going to move it. Now we're able to take now we're able to tap into this new identity. How do we do that? Verse 5 to 8, the next section here. Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Paul's going to run a contrast on us now. He's going to contrast the, the flesh, the way the flesh thinks, the way the flesh operates, the way the, the, the flesh dominates things, and he's going to compare that now to the way the Spirit thinks and the Spirit operates and how the Spirit should dominate things. Okay? And that's all he's going to do here is he's just going to run a contrast on us. The flesh. By the way, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. <laughs> I love Moses says to Israel, I set before you death and life. Please choose life. <laughs> you know, you have a choice in the matter here. Don't ever forget that. You're the one choosing. God has said, it's what? It's done. I've given everything to you. You choose now where you're going to walk and how you're going to live. Think about the flesh. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. For to be carnally minded is death. Come over with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And notice how the flesh thinks. All right. Now, this is true of lost people as well as saved people because you still got that old stinking rotten flesh hanging around. But what are we? What's our relationship to it? Dead. Okay? But we still have it. Here it is, 2, 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. See that? All that's in the world... There's nothing left out of these three categories. If you, you can say, yeah, but what about? No, it'll fit in one of these three categories. When the Lord is tempted back there in Matthew and in, Mar and in Luke by the devil, he's tempted in these three categories. That's why the writer can say the Lord was tempted in all points as common to, to man. Same as man. He, oh, yeah, but he didn't have the Internet. No, but it fits in these three categories. Yeah, but he didn't have the baseball game on Sunday morning. Yeah, but it fits in these three. The issue, okay, follow that. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. You go back to Genesis chapter 3 back there, verse 16, and you know, what, you know what Eve saw? She saw that the fruit was what? Good. Uh, Gen I just, the verse just slipped my mind. So Genesis 3, I didn't get it right, verse 16. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, think about that, good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, lust of the flesh, good for food, it's going to fill me up. It's going to make me feel good. By the way, it's a grape, not an apple. Okay? Was good, and it, you know what it did? It looked good. Have you ever seen grapes and they just look too good to be true? And then you bite into it and you go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know? Or you bite in and you go, ooh, that was really good. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. There's the pride of life. And what begins to happen is that's the mindset of the flesh. You know what the, the flesh says? You know what it says. Hey, will, this, will it make me make it good? What, what, what's it going to do for me? Lust of the eyes. Is it going to make me wise, that pride of life? Come back to Romans 8. 
So when you mind the things of the flesh, by the way, on your way back to 8, stop in Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians 5 and verse, well, verse 19. Well, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust, the affections, the appetite that influences the way you think. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then he lays them out there for you in a nice little list. So when you're doing something, guess what you can find out? Am I doing the spirit or am I doing the flesh? Well, if it's in that list, you're in the flesh. Verse, 19, verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no what? Oh, isn't that it? Why? Because the law has been fulfilled. It's been taken care of. So if I'm doing the fruit of the Spirit, then where am I walking after? The Spirit. So you got this contrast. Come back to Romans 8. The flesh, the mind, the way you think, the lust of it, what's driving it. Uh, Romans 8, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is what? Death. And again, the death is functional death. And when you think about functional death... It's not enjoying God and all that he's provided for you in the context of your life, in the daily details. That's functional death. You're not able, you're not, you're not enjoying God. You're not enjoying who you are in Christ. You're rather, you're, 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 uh, you're miserable. <laughs> you're frustrated. Oh, wretched man, you're just miserable. Now, to be spiritually minded, verse 6, is what? Life and peace. So then what does it mean to be spiritually minded? What is it to, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit? Well, to walk after the Spirit, to mind the things of the Spirit, is to pay attention to what the Spirit pays attention to. Duh. It's simple. This isn't complicated. That verse in, in, first, in 2 Corinthians eleven three, 3, the simplicity that's in Christ. We, our flesh makes this complicated. It, it, have you ever witnessed to someone and they say, oh, that's too easy? That's too simple? It's got to be, what else do I have to do? Who's, what is, what's driving them to say that? Their flesh is. Because what's their flesh? To, I got home, we got home yesterday after the men's fellowship and uh, my honeydew list kicked in, and out in the backyard we go, and in like three hours we did two weeks worth of work, you know. So I'm s slowly walking back in, not really, but yeah. What do you do? You're out there. What's your flesh say? Got to get it done. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. My my mind's like, you dummy. Why don't you go sit down for a minute? No, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You know. Then when I did sit down, I went, <laughs> you know. And I did what Jesus did on the boat. I took a nap, you know. Jesus, by the way, Jesus believed in naps. He got on that boat and he went to sleep. I'm going to lay my head down here. I'm tired. <laughs> you know, I enjoy the nap every now and then. But no, what happens? What's your flesh want to do? It wants to perform. It wants to do. But being, minding the spirit, the things of the spirit... You see, it's not complicated. What is the Spirit consumed with? He's consumed with the things that Christ is doing and what, what Christ is doing and what he's doing with you and to you. By the way, religion makes all this complicated. That's why we make it complicated because we've all been introduced to religion somewhere along our life's line. In the context, walking after the Spirit is to mind the things of the Spirit. And again, to walk after. Let's go there. And again, where does the Holy Spirit operate? He operates in the realm of your thinking as he uses the Word of God in that realm. Verse 6 says that you can be joyful and have peace. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to have in today's age, in our culture, in our society? is to have joy and peace. But you know what? You can have it. 
That's why when things around us get a little more complicated and things begin to go down, I saw a, a picture on Facebook, had a guy's pickup truck, and he said $800 worth of lumber in 2008, and it was this big old massive load, and $800 of lumber in 2021, it was like two little boards, three boards. See, when money starts to run out and run thin, you know what people do? They go back to the very basics of life, food and raiment. They really do. But you know what they then begin to do? They begin to look for answers, an answer, a help. We have a song, a helper in a time of trouble. They look, well, who's a help? How about the Spirit? Well, how do we get the Spirit? We trust Christ. We got, see, so now we, as ambassadors, we have a whole ministry to people who, one, don't know who God is, the God of the Bible is. We're sitting actually in the same timing as the first century, as the Apostle Paul did, where, where society is looking to get better, and actually, instead of going up, it's going down. And he goes in, and here we are, and you know what happens? If you told people they had an opportunity to have joy and peace, you know, they're going to listen to you for a little bit anyway. And that's the opportunity there. By the way, joy and peace, long-suffering, those are natural responses of minding the things of the Spirit. That's natural. The fo- because the focus is on being what? Consumed with what the Spirit is consumed with. Come, come over with me to 2 Corinthians 13. I know we looked at this last time. We'll do it again here. You see, he's consumed with the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished for humanity. He's preoccupied with who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. And you know what? Our thinking should be there as well. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, Paul ends this, uh, ends the letter to the Corinthians here. The grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. The, there's the Trinity, great Trinity verse, by the way. The love of God. Uh, have, we've seen that already. Romans 5, verse 8, But God committed His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His love, by the way, not our love for Him, but His love for us. Then he says, the communion of the Holy Ghost. Um, That fellowship we're to have, that commune we are to have with the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we do that? How does that work? Well, when you think about communion, you think about fellowship, fellows in a ship, having this oneness. But also in the word communion is the word communicate. You see, the Holy Spirit has something to communicate with you. Therefore, we have communion with the Spirit. You see, I, you can't mind the things of the Spirit unless the Spirit begins to teach you what He's minding. Unless He tells you something. Come over to Philippians 2. You see, the Holy Spirit works through the Word, And he uses God's word to communicate to us. Look at Philippians 2, verse 1. Wonderful verse here. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy. You see that? Fellowship of the Spirit, communion of the Spirit. So how, do, how does that work, right? Come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses we've looked at, and I don't want to dwell in them, but I want them to get them into your thinking here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, quickly here, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. By the way, notice those three areas. 
eye, ear, the ear gate, the eye gate, the heart gate. Here it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All those areas that man operates in. Guess what you can't know? The things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So he did reveal the things that he loves for them that... um, God, the things that God has prepared for them that love him, but he just didn't throw them out there for everybody to know about. He says, if you want to know this, you've got to have the Spirit. So he starts, verse 11, For what a man knoweth, the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man which is in him. Here's the concept. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are, what's that next word? freely given unto us of God. Look, if you want to know the things that he prepared for you, the things he's freely given to you, Romans 8, we're going to get down there, and he's going to, um, it's in verse 30, uh, da, 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 da. verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He says, you want to know that? You've got to have my spirit. The way you have my spirit, you go to Calvary, trust in the blood, shed blood of the word, and then you're, the spirit's given to you, Ephesians 1, 13. And when that happens, now you're going to be able to understand, verse 13, which things also we speak not of the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You want to understand the spiritual things that you have over there, the things that God has prepared for them that love him, then you have to have the things which, um, spiritual things with spiritual, you have to have the things that the mind of the spirit are chasing. Okay, the doctrine, the information. There's some words that communicate the revelation of the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And who's revealing that information is the Holy Spirit. As he takes the word of God, 2 Timothy 3.16 over there, for all scriptures given by inspiration, okay, and is profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction. I love this one. Instruction. In righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. How does that work? The Spirit works through those words, and he goes to work. Come over to John 14 with me. John 14. You see, when he says, hey, if you mind the things of the Spirit, you're going to have joy and peace, a life of peace and joy, thanksgiving, long-suffering. You're going to have all that fruit over there. You've got to get into the book because the Spirit's working with that book. That's why having the right book is the key to this. Very critical to have the right King James Bible, (laughs) to have the right one, okay? It's very critical to have that. Why? Because where does the Spirit work? He works in those words. Up until the late or mid-1900s, the Holy Bible was what your Bible was called. And it was always a King James Bible. 1881, the Revised Standard Version came out. So then it, you know what it was called? The Revised Standard Version. It was never called the Bible. Then in the, in the 1900s, then they moved that Bible term, got used for all of them. But your book was always called the Holy Bible. The Bible. Okay? John 14 Jesus Christ is talking about the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter coming to him. Uh, John 14, verse uh, 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall send and shall give you, never miss this word, another comforter. Everybody says, oh, he's sending the comforter. No, he's sending another comforter. The first comforter was the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let, let the children come. Bring me your sick. I'll heal them. He was their first comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now watch, even the spirit of what? Truth. Catch that. The spirit of truth. Come over to chapter 17. Here's why he's called the spirit of truth. Chapter 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's why he's magnified his word above his name. 
Psalms 138. You see, if you think about this, you're there in John, go back to chapter 14. If you think about this, about you and I, we live in the truth of who we are in Christ. We learn that from the scriptures, rightly divided. The Spirit comes in using that truth. He's the Spirit of truth. Verse 26, he says here, Jesus does to the little flock, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. He's going to teach them all things, but he's going to bring some things to their what? That's the Gospels. How does he remind them? The Gospels are written. He can bring it back up into their mind. Actually, if you come over to chapter 16, this is, this is interesting here too. I know we're kind of jumping around. 16 verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of what? Notice how he, he identifies him there very specifically here, doesn't he? Specific truth, spirit of truth. Not just spirit. The spirit of truth uh, is come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to what? Come, there's the causation of Hebrews through Revelation being written. Hebrews over there, chapter 2 says we're writing of things to come. There it is. Who's causing that to happen? The Spirit does as he uses holy men and moves them and gets Peter and James and John to write. Gets Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John done. Gets Luke to write Acts. He gets it all done. Why? Because the Lord didn't. He, the, the Lord's time is out of time to teach them. He goes, I'm going to go die. I'm going to be crucified, buried, and rose again the third day. But when I go and I'm glorified to my Father, Acts 2, then the Spirit's going to come. And when that happens, He's going to teach you the rest of the way. But He's called the Spirit of Truth. Chapter 15 here, verse 26. Chapter 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, notice the last of that verse. He shall testify of me. Come back to Romans 8. Think about that. He's going to testify of who? For the little flock, their Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does 8.16 say? For the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What's he going to testify there? He's going to testify that you too belong to not your Messiah, but your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See? The man, Jesus Christ. The, the mediator. You follow that? So what the Lord says the Holy Spirit's doing in the Gospels, and in that early Acts period, Paul says, he's doing the same thing to you and me, just using different information, different revelation. He's telling you through the Word that God gave Paul to you and I all about what Jesus Christ has done and all that he is. He's consumed with teaching, using the sound doctrine. And that's what Romans, 5, Romans 8 here is dealing with. How do you and I access the power source? We have Him. How do we access Him? We become, we mind, we become consumed with what He's consumed with. And that's the scriptures delivered to us by our Apostle Paul, Romans the Philemon, that has to do with who we are in Christ and everything he's doing in Christ and everything the Father has planned to do through the church, the body of Christ. And therefore we become, well, we access the power source. We bring that into the details of our life. We mind the things of the Spirit when we become consumed with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why this identity stuff is so critical. You want to have a life in peace? You want to have joy and peace? Don't be consumed with all that mess out there. 
be consumed with him. And you know what begins to happen? You'll go through the groceries. Boy, we were in the grocery store the other day. It was the most frustrating thing I ever did. Long time. I'm like, I never want to come back to this place. But I just can't get over ordering it online and having somebody deliver my food to me. I just can't get over that. So I, got, I you know what I have to practice? Patience. <laughs> Long suffering. Leaving the weapon at home in the gun safe, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but don't be consumed with that. Go in and say, you know what, this is something that has to be done, and let's do it with a cheerful heart. And it begins to consume you. Now, we'll pick up in verse 7 and go on down through. Catch this again. But just catch, we have a power center now, the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to tap into that, and we need to be tapped into that. Otherwise, you know where we're going to go? Right back underneath that law program, and it's going to kill you. Because you think you can do it, and you can't. Okay? All right, I owe you a few more minutes, but we'll see you at 11. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the excitement, the instruction here that we can have and who we are in you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we'll see.